welcome to Creative Piecemeal Podcast, a podcast for creatives. I'm your host, Tammy Takeishi. Join me for compelling conversations with artists, actors, authors, musicians, and other creatives about the impact of the creative and fine arts in their lives and our ever-changing world. Thank you for listening. Welcome to another episode of Creative Piecemeal Podcast. Today, I'm joined by one of my good friends and fellow music therapist, Tara Davis. Tara Davis is a graduate of the Boston Conservatory and Montclair State. Prior to becoming a music therapist, she held positions as a vocalist, actress, and director across the United States. Currently, Ms. Davis established and is the internship director at her work and is the current vice president of the New Jersey Association of Music Therapy. She's also an adjunct faculty member at Montclair State in addition to her duties as a full-time music therapist in New Jersey. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Tammy. Hi. It's good to see you again. It's been a long time. I know. It's been so long. Nice to see you too. Indeed. So what have you been up to? What's new? Well, the newest thing is my adjunct professor position at Montclair State. So that just started September and I'm teaching practicum one and two, then next semester. So I'm teaching the class that accompanies the students who are doing field work. Nice. Yeah. So far, I love it. It's really, I have three sections of the same class, back to back, three different groups of students. And it's great. I just, I really do enjoy teaching in, we're in person and I love it. Wonderful. It sounds like you've definitely kept busy. Oh yeah. I've been really busy. I've, so I work full time during the rest of the week at Fellowship Senior Village at Health Center nursing home type as a music therapist. And I have the internship, like you mentioned, and I have interns and I have practicum students. And then I'm the vice president of the New Jersey Association of Music Therapy, which is a two-year term that is finishing up at the end of this year. And we have our big annual fall seminar, which is in mid planning, and it's almost going to be kicked off uh, at the end of this month. So Yeah, Tammy, I've been busy. (laughs) But it sounds like a wonderful but full plate for sure. Yes, it is. It is a very full plate. Normally, I'm very accustomed to keeping busy. It's hard lately. I think after the pandemic, I'm a little bit um, frazzled around the edges working in a nursing home uh, straight through, you know, in person. But I feel I'm feeling better, you know. I've been vaccinated about a hundred times, so I feel good superhero feelings and (laughs) I'm going to be calming down a little bit after the holidays because the the vice presidency will be over (laughs) so that I can have a little spare time. Well, that's good. That's good. And of course, now you have a very blossoming music therapy career, but you've done some other amazing things in your life, such as being an actress and vocalist and obviously those things influence But what inspired you to become a musician originally and then later a music therapist? Well, I guess it all happened. I was in about seventh grade. I always loved um, Broadway musicals. My grandparents took me to my very first musical when I was about eight to see The Wiz on Broadway with Stephanie Mills playing Dorothy. And I loved it. I had the record. I played the record. I danced all around. I took, um, I was fortunate enough to have ballet lessons that my mom um, and dad sent me to. And I loved that. But one day, and I, I, I took piano lessons, which I didn't like at all. I didn't enjoy my piano lessons. But one day I just opened my mouth and sang at the top of my lungs. And what came out was huge. It was just a really big, already sort of developed sound. And it kind of took me back. I was in maybe late seventh, early eighth grade. I got a big reaction from the family that happened to be listening at the time. You know, they were like, what? That's what? what?" And I also felt that way. I didn't know, you know, I just had, I opened my mouth and it was like Ethel Merman jumped out. 
And uh, so I decided this is what I want to do. This is what I want to be. And then I never really looked back. I went, I, I was in the high school choir for four years. I, um, I was actually president of high school choir for four years. It was a very small choir, so I didn't have any competition. And I was in all of the musicals in high school. And then I auditioned for the Boston Conservatory for my bachelor's. I got in, I went, and it was really super intense training. I was like a triple major of music, theater, and dance. And I just worked hard. I graduated in four years and then I got out and I started auditioning and I worked as an actor, um, a musical theater performer, mostly all in theater, um, mostly musicals, although not always musicals, sometimes just plays for most of my twenties, pretty much all through, you know, that time. And I moved to Chicago and I got a job at what happened was Am I talking too much here? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. This is all about you. Oh, this is so nice. I got a job in Chicago. Well, first I got a job in New York to do Oklahoma in Wisconsin. So I was in the musical <laughs> Oklahoma in Wisconsin, which I had auditioned for in New York at the Fireside Playhouse in Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin. Woo! I know there's lots of actors out there who've been there. Um, it's closed now, recently closed, but it was a, a huge dinner theater and they would bus people in from all over the, the area. And um, we did 13 shows a week of Oklahoma. While I was there, a woman I worked with Alice, my friend in the cast, she lived in Chicago at the time. And so we had two days off, Monday and Tuesday off. So she took a bunch of us to Chicago to visit. And I was like, I love this city. It's so great. It's so pleasant. It's so much fun. So I, through her, auditioned for a national touring children's theater company that was based in Chicago. And I got the job. Actually, I didn't get the job at first. And then they said, I'm so sorry. Thank you very much. And then they called me back a few months later and said, oh, the woman we hired has changed her mind. Would you like it still? And I said, yes, I would. So I moved to Chicago. I worked with this company and I started taking improv class at night at Improv Olympic in Chicago. And I ended up getting put on a, a team to perform. It was like teams. And I really have to say it was life changing. And um, I did that. I I I didn't intend on living in Chicago for long. I just only the short contract of my theater job. And I ended up staying for six years, made friends, changed my whole career because I really learned about improv and how to improvise as an actor on stage. And I really loved it. I loved everything about it. That bit is, was important in informing then music therapy. So I came home, I, I still tried to work out of the New York area as an actor and it gets, it gets very difficult, very fast, um, especially in your late twenties, early thirties. I was, you know, it's tired. You get tired of traveling. You get tired of not knowing what your next job is going to be. And I was kind of thinking, mm, maybe there's something else for me. It doesn't really matter what happened in the next 12 years or so, lots of different things, yada, yada, yada. <laughs> and then I was, thinking I was in my early forties. So cut, cut 10 years ahead. And I was like, I have to get back somehow. I have to get back to my original roots, which is music, improvisation. I don't know how I'm going to do it. And I was sitting in my driveway, listening to a story on NPR about music therapy. I was gripped and it was a story about music therapy, which is amazing that I heard this because since then, I don't think there's been anything else on NPR about music therapy. <laughs> and it was about a, a couple different music therapists. One of them was at the, the Mayo Clinic in Cleveland. And I was just so impressed with how it was music, but it was in a medical setting and it was helping people. And I was just, I sat there in the car in my driveway waiting for the story to finish. And then I just went inside and I was like, I, I think this is what I want to do. And I looked up the schools and there was Montclair State, literally my hometown school. I grew up not a full mile, I don't think, maybe two miles from Montclair State. My mother went there. My aunt went there. Everybody's mother went there because everyone's mother was a teacher back in those days. And it's, it was a teaching college. And so I, I called and Dr. Abrams like answered the phone and he was like, hello, I think at least that's how I remember it. And I talked to him for a few minutes and set up an interview to just find out more. And that's how it started. 
So I went back to graduate school in my early 40s. And um, that was the journey. Thanks for asking. It's a crazy story. It's an interesting journey, but but so beautiful to see that, you know, you had wonderful, varied experiences and you still were able to find your place. Yeah, it's amazing. I don't know. I feel like music therapy is something that if you think it's your place, it probably is. I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm wrong about that, but I just I feel like if you feel passionate about any type of work with people where you're really helping and you're really making an instant difference, mm-hmm. instantaneous results, not to mention long-term results, then therapy is great if you're lucky enough to be a musician. Yeah. I feel like we're a growing crew across the world. Yeah, definitely growing. So that's it. I Oh, and then I, I graduated in 2015, but then I still didn't complete my mass, my thesis cumulative project until 2017. So that's, that's when I was up and running. Well, I was already working before that with the board certification. Yeah. The, those theses, everybody loves to write a long paper. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I sort of did a project. I did like a cumulative project that had a performance attached to it. So I got a little bit of a break on the length of the paper. No charts and graphs for you? No, no, <laughs> I, no, I wrote, I wrote like a musical. So oh, I wrote like nice. a 30 minute little like operetta accompanying a paper. So I guess, I guess no one wanted to read a whole big thesis in addition to showing up for a live performance. <laughs> well, it still sounds like it was quite a work though. Speaking of writing music, who are some of your favorite composers? Harold Arlen, I think, is one of my most favorite. The Gershwins, for sure. Like I like Debussy in the realm of more classical. Oh, and Sondheim. Stephen Sondheim, for sure. That's a great list. Those are probably my faves. And you already play a lot of instruments, but if you could play any other instrument, like you wake up and you're just instantly good at an, just an, another one, what would that be? Mm, oh, that's such a good question. It's a toughie. <laughs> Probably. It is a tough one. I feel like bass. <laughs> Upright bass or electric bass? Electric. Because I really love being in a band. I love I love being in a rock band and I don't get to a lot because my voice isn't well, partially because there's enough singers in the world and partially because my voice isn't that rock and I can sing. I can sing a lot of different types of music, but I feel like if I could just jump in and play bass and then sing the songs that were perfect for my voice, like all of the like Tina Turner and, you know, R and B stuff but then I would be playing the bass. I, I think that would be great. <laughs> that would be really cool. Yeah. And there's not enough bass players around and definitely not enough female bass players. I feel like it's a, there's a shortage. Yes. I only actually know of one and that's it. So yeah, me too. Probably the same one. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> so if you could describe yourself in one word, what would that be? I guess it would be vocal. <laughs> I'm very, I'm very talkative. I like to sing. I like to talk. I like to tell stories. I like to explain things. That's great. And, and you're an advocate in the field, you know, taking on students and mentoring and passing on wisdom. I like to do that. I think I mentioned my mother is a teacher and my, um, her sister is a teacher. And I think I inherited that gene but I didn't ever go to teaching school. So I'm not like a, I'm, I don't have a music ed degree, but I do love it. Would you say that your family has been a really big influence in your life? Yeah. I mean, they're not musicians. I only had one uh, uncle who was a musician, but yes, I mean, we're very close. My father is a dentist, a retired dentist. So of course I grew up with him being in a medical field every day. So that influenced me. I think I I had an awareness of what that would be like if I were working in a healthcare field. And my mom's a great teacher and she's an outgoing, fun person. And yeah, we're close, but they're they're not musicians, but 
they insisted on piano lessons anyway. <laughs> hey, it turned out. It did. It did. I begrudgingly thank her. <laughs> I think most <laughs> kids do. They're like, oh, well, I guess that wasn't so bad. <laughs> you know, it's piano is hard. It really is hard. <laughs> There's only some people who can just click with it. Understandable. You know, speaking of things that are hard, you obviously had a long and winding road to get to music therapy, but are there any barriers, whether external or internal, that you encountered in reaching where you are today? Going back to school as a middle-aged person is really challenging emotionally, not to mention actually challenging in terms of it's hard, school is hard, college is hard, master's degrees, no matter what you go for are challenging. And then probably you have some sort of day job and or family or both. So all those things were real, real barriers to overcome for sure. But then I've been talking lately with one of my interns, who's also not in her early twenties about the hurdle of you go through your life, you know, maybe whatever your education is, high school, college, and then you work in a field and no matter what that field is, if you're working in it, you're getting better at it, you're learning your experience. And by the time a certain amount of time passes, you're like an expert in that field, whether it's, you know, cutting hair or selling shoes or being a performer or a teacher, doesn't matter. You get good at it over time and you become accustomed to the role of um, competency in a field, you know, whatever that is. And so much time passes from being what it feels like to be a student that you lose track of that feeling of not knowing anything about something, knowing nothing about something, and also being told all about something in a big way. I mean, it's one thing at your job, you get a little training here, a little training, a little feedback there, but basically you're good at what you do people are paying you money for it. And that's the relationship that you develop with your work. And then you go back to school as a middle-aged person and it's jarring to accept being terrible at something or being clueless or being having to learn, right? So in the beginning, when you're doing homework and you're writing papers, you're feeling like it has to be perfect, but I don't know what I'm doing. How can I put these two things together? And then you have to remember, wait a minute, they're not paying me for this. I'm paying them. Okay. So they need to tell me what it is that I don't understand. So I'll give it my best, but it's a shift. It's a real shift in gears, which was hard throughout the coursework of the master's degree. And then it was really hard at the internship because that felt even more like a job. And so here I am at something that feels like a job and I don't feel terribly competent right off the bat. I feel nervous. I feel like I really have more to learn. And um, so I just, you have to kind of let go of all that. I don't know if it's ego or that comfort zone is just gone. There's no comfort zone anymore. Now you are back in a role that you haven't touched since you were 20 or 21. At least I hadn't. So that was really hard emotionally. I, I think of all the times I came in the house after a long day of classes or a long day of, you know, studying or taking a test exams or whatever, and thought, I can't do this. I'm never, I'm never going to make it through. This is really, really hard. It was almost always rooted in that emotional, how can I plow forward into something that I'm simply not good at and don't know anything about. And then it just took a lot of talking myself out of the tree and just sort of reassuring myself that I'm not supposed to be good at it yet. I'm still a student. I'm still learning. I still have more learning to do. And then I'm going to do an internship and then I'm going to practice and then I'm going to get back. So that whole, that was hard. That was really hard. I didn't talk about it much at the time. I don't think, I don't think I could even put my finger on it, but in retrospect, now I realize that I think for anybody that goes back to school as a, not just as an adult, because if you go back when you're 30 or 28 or 32, I feel like you're still early in your years of, of becoming sort of competent as a person who knows stuff. By the time I really dug into the classwork, I was like 45 
And I was really rattled by being clueless. So Hmm. that was hard, but I did it. You did. (laughs) Yeah, you did it. And I must say for what it's worth, you know, going to school with you and, and, you know, sharing internship experience with you, I, I never got that impression. You know, I always thought, man, Tara has it all together and she brings such a wonderful, diverse life experience to this role that people in their twenties could never bring. Well, thank you. I, I'm glad. Well, like I said, I don't think I was aware of what I was struggling with until after the fact. So now I can really isolate it and say, this is what was hard, but Thank you. The diverse experience, though, that you mentioned, that is also a source of, you're right, it's, it, was, it was my and your and every other music therapist's diverse experience that helps them become better at being a music therapist. But that was something that was also hard for me to um, embrace because I wasn't just a music major undergrad. I was a musical theater major. So my degree wasn't strictly music. It wasn't a bachelor's in music or music ed like most people. So I felt like I was at a big disadvantage compared to others and other, other things as well. And it really wasn't until I started working that I realized, oh, it doesn't every journey that brings you to the point of music therapy or like music or whatever it is, your own musical journey is the right one. And it makes you unique and it makes your work all that richer. And I always tell now my new students, my, you know, six weeks of having students, I tell them that because they're not all, many of them have music degrees, but not all of them. Some of them are, there was actually, I have one student from my alma mater. I was like, Hey, and I, you know, I told them all your journey on that road to becoming a music therapist all those musical and improvisational and artistic and theatrical and life experiences that you have had, parenting, whatever you had along the way is going to be to your advantage. Somehow or another, one day you're going to say, oh, that thing is really helping me right now, whatever that thing was. I've got to say your students are lucky to have you. Thanks, Tammy. I was wondering what has been the the most important thing you've learned in the last couple of years during this really intense time in history? I feel like the human's ability to adapt and change is really, uh, I think, the key to our success as creatures (laughs) and globally and community-wise, and then individually adapting. The kind of changing that we all had to do, last minute, drop everything, everything that you ever knew to be the case about your job, say, or everything you ever knew to be the case about how to socialize or how to teach a class or anything. Now, it just, it changed so fast. It changed and then it adjusted after the fact. So I think I guess I learned about my own ability to tolerate change, like last minute instantaneous change, my own ability to what I have resilience for and what I don't. I was just thinking about this this morning. Uh, I think a lot of people talked during the whole pandemic, a lot of us talked about um, how time started to feel. I don't know if anyone talked about this with you or if you felt this, that time became very distorted, right? So those first eight weeks of the pandemic seemed like years. And then all of a sudden, everything went by like that. So a lot of shifting of time. And I was thinking about time this morning, how much time has passed since the beginning of the pandemic, right? Since the first weeks and how those first eight weeks from the time the first person where I work caught COVID until they started testing us weekly for COVID. It was about eight to 10 weeks past from point A to point B. When I think about those eight to 10 weeks, it feels like that was a year. That period of time was so, so hard and so upsetting and so scary. And we, we all had trauma coming out of that for those of us, especially who were working in a healthcare setting where people were getting COVID. And, and then as soon as they started testing us, and then like the first time they tested the, the team, 
you know, they sent 35 people home or whatever it was because they all tested positive. This tremendous relief began, right? The relief that has continued began then, but still it's, I can't, I can't wrap my head around the warping of time surrounding those eight to 10 weeks there. And then the, the following like year between then and getting, or it was between that point and then the vaccine was like another 10 months was like got vaccinated in January. And then that was like a new relief, but still not recovered fully, but then gradually, you know, it's just like really weird. So yeah, I learned about my own resilience, how time is an illusion. (laughs) Yeah. And I think it caused everyone sort of nationally to reevaluate. Definitely. Definitely. And you know, whether someone was a frontline worker or a stay at home mom or a teacher, you know, or a retail worker, like it's just phenomenal how people coped and adjusted and found their resilience, you know, like, like you were saying, you know, I think everyone was tested in their own ways. Yeah. Yeah. And everyone had to think on their feet and make drastic changes in their own life. I mean, you've got kids home from school, you've got teaching jobs and and healthcare jobs. Well, half of the music therapists were you know, working in full PPE and the other half were laid off. Mm -hmm, So there was mm -hmm. like this in the community, not just music therapists, the community of everybody, there was this weird dichotomy between people who were suddenly always at home and the people who were suddenly, there weren't enough people at work. So they were working extra hours. It was like this crazy thing. Yeah. Yeah. It was quite a shift for sure. Yeah, it really was. And I thought it was an interesting timing that set the stage for so many demonstrations and such a sort of like a a civil rights sort of sudden resurgence of ideas and and conversation i thought i think now in re- like at the time i was a little bit like what what wait wait we're 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 already doing a pandemic and now we're doing this other thing too oh my goodness it seems like a lot at once but now of course everything hindsight is 2020 i see that the breaking down of our kind of marching through time without thinking that got had to be broken down in order to make room for these conversations that were you know 100 years overdue mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. i think that was really interesting timing yeah. Yeah. And, and of course it, it spilled on and we have so many more important conversations that we continue to have. Yeah. I mean, it, it was, it is the silver lining, I think is all of the, the deep thinking that's being done about our lives and our relationships and our society. Mm-hmm. I would agree. I mean, nobody wants to go through a pandemic, but there's certainly lessons to be learned through, through every situation, positive and negative. Yeah. And obviously it, it had affected your work life. Did that affect your creative process and the way you approached your patients and your clients and your students? Yeah. So my students had to go home at the time. So that was, they were like gone for all the way until uh, the vaccine happened. So that was a long absence of students and the, the residents where I work, we used to, I used to do a combination of mostly group music therapy, but also one-to-one visits. And um, we couldn't do groups anymore at all. So that shifted to only being allowed to do individual visits, one-to-one individual music therapy sessions. And even that was challenging, of course, because in the beginning for those eight weeks, we didn't know enough about how it was being transmitted. I mean, I was reading every single day and I, I feel like early on, I became convinced through my reading that it was the aerosols, not the droplets. So I felt really strong feelings about keeping the airflow going in a a situation. So when I did get in, I didn't, obviously I wasn't seeing people all the time. But when I did see somebody in person, just of my own accord, nobody told me, I just felt like this aerosol thing, this is, this is correct. I, uh, I would open the door to the, the person's room and I would seat myself with like my back 
toward the door. And if I could open a window, I would. And I would be more than six feet away and where I had full PPE, including a, a shield and a mask. But I would make sure there was a little bit of airflow. That's what I was really looking for was some kind of airflow. And then we would have our session. And I would just hope for the best. And, uh, you know, it all worked out okay. That's good. That's good to hear. So you've had many years working so far as a music therapist. Is there a favorite memory about your time so far that you'd be able to share? So many good things. Okay. So one time I was doing with seniors, the song Shine on Harvest Moon. And it was a a group that I do sometimes with more with like assisted living, independent seniors, let's say. I call it singing for wellness because it's just uh, like a nice way of framing getting together and singing a bunch of familiar songs. We sang Shine on Harvest Moon. And in that part where I, I ain't had no loving since January, February, June, or July. And I, oh, I, I know I was, I was asking them to guess. Um, okay, I'm going to say a phrase and you have to remember what song it's from. And then we'll sing the song, you know. And I said that. I said, I ain't had no love. And I said it in rhythm. January, February, and they joined me. June or July, they all knew it. And then this one woman says, oh, I can go back a lot further than that. And someone else chimes in. I think we all can. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> so that's a funny story. I always tell that. it's it's It wasn't really a deep therapeutic moment or anything like that, but it was so funny. I ain't had no loving since January, February, June, or July. Oh, I can go back further than that. <laughs> <laughs> so you told me about a favorite memory, but if you had to pick a favorite song or a theme song for your life or for the work that you do, do you have one? It's funny because you, well, it's just such a well-known song, uh, but the song Let It Be, is really, really traveled with me very well. When you're thinking about, you know, using, having a song in music therapy that speaks to almost everybody and also to me. And I really uh, have, I would say that the, the use of Let It Be has been huge. Like there's, there's so many circumstances and so many populations and so many situations where I've, I've brought that to the table as a song to work with. And it has been over and over again, a valuable piece of music for people's change, for people Mm. moving forward, for people gaining comfort. Even seniors, even people in their 90s, they are familiar enough with it that it resonates. And uh, so I would say that one is really valuable. It's a good one. It's got a lot of bang for its book. Yeah, it's so simple, but so perfect. Also, but a second one is also very useful and very important to me as well is uh, You'll Never Walk Alone from Carousel. Oh, yeah. oh, that's a good one. I'm going to add that one to my list. Oh yeah, that's a really good a song of hope. So those are good. Very good. What's a common myth or stereotype about music therapists that you hope to break with your work? I don't even know that people give music therapy enough thought to have a myth about it. I wish there was a myth. Um, (laughs) Well, I would say the stereotype is that what I do is performing and that I go from place to place in the healthcare center where I work putting on shows. So I really work hard to try, but you can't, I mean, there's just so many times you can stop and have a conversation about that when you're on your way to a designated time when people are waiting for you for a music therapy session. Only way that it can really happen besides like, you know, doing a in-service, which not always the most popular uh, event is to invite people to see what you're doing sometimes, or really insert yourself into the clinical work in a way that, in a way that they find that they need. So I guess, yes. So the problem is 
people think I'm putting on a show or that I'm going to perform. And the remedy, I think for me, at least with, with the team, with my fellow staff is to attend clinical report, to, um, to go to the care conferences and represent the, my piece of the pie and make sure that everyone understands that um, not only do I know what I'm talking about and I know these people, I know them well, I know what their goals, I know what their needs are, but that my piece of the pie in this team kind of healthcare is unique and it can only be brought from me. So I feel like the, 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 the people, the nurses and the social workers that, that catch on to that, 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 but I have to show up to, to do that, right? You gotta be present. You have to have a presence. You have to show up. You have to be in the meetings. You have to, a lot of times for me, it's I really have to insert myself into these meetings that I deserve to be at. And nobody thought to invite the music therapist. And here I am for clinical report, you know? So I think in, and that's in a, that's in a healthcare setting in a, in a education setting, it might be a different way of kind of making it known that you are, what you bring is a piece of the pie that's needed for the overall education or the overall healthcare of the person. So I yeah. guess that's it. Yeah, I would say that stereotype is really pervasive across all, a lo- many, if not all of music therapy environments. Yeah, that's it. I mean, it's really impossible to change that. It's crazy because nobody thinks the physical therapists are going to play soccer. Like nobody says, oh, you're going to go start up a soccer game. <laughs> nobody says that, even though they're wearing like some sort of athletic gear and they're physical therapists, you know, nobody makes that mistake. Nobody makes a mistake that the speech therapist is going to um, train the seniors on how to have a debate team or give a speech (laughs) or, you know, speak without a dialect, like a newscaster. That's not what the speech therapist is doing. So it's a little bit hard, but wow, what have we done? Here we are. (laughs) Yes. I feel like with, with each meeting and each student that graduates and goes into the field, you know, we have more and more opportunities to educate people of how important and powerful our profession is. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And I think it's slowly, slowly chipping away at sort of the education of the public. I mean, certainly more people know what a music therapist is, even than we were in, even since we were in school. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. Has your life in the creative arts turned out the way you expected? No, no, I never thought I would leave performing or a combination of performing and teaching. So that's what's different. I mean, I still perform sometimes, but not often. And really what I do is very different than performing. And I don't think I expected that, but I didn't know what music therapy was. So maybe if I knew about it earlier, I might've jumped in sooner. Although I would say that I was not ready to be a music therapist in my early twenties when I first graduated, I wouldn't have been, I wasn't there yet. But yeah, no, very different, but good. That's always a good thing. So fun question before we get to a a big one. If you could invite just a few creative artists to a dinner, who would they be? And what would you eat? Well, I would invite, so this is a hard question because I used to be an actor. And so I partially want to just invite a lot of my old friends that I haven't seen in a long time from Chicago, which is not really an exciting answer. Like I, okay. If I was going to invite famous artists, okay. I'll take somebody from each field. So I would like, um, you know, Cindy Sherman, she's a visual artist. She has, um, a, a contemporary art and photography. So Cindy Sherman, She's an artist. I'll take, I would love to have her for dinner. And then I would like to also bring somebody from, uh, I think a a theater, a playwright, Um, the guy who wrote, I can't think of his name right now. The guy who wrote Angels in America, love his writing. Oh, can't think of his name, but you know, the guy who wrote, the playwright who wrote Angels in America. And I would like to have uh, that jazz musician, Wynton Marsalis, the trumpet player and improviser. Some that that seems like it, he would be great. Oh, and Audra McDonald, definitely her, my favorite current Broadway singer. 
I don't know. I, I need a dancer here in the mix. Oh, Rita Moreno. She's still alive. She would be great to have. I'll, I'll take her. Um, so that would be good. I would invite them. And what would we eat? Oh, I don't know. Whatever everybody wanted. A buffet then, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. A buffet with a wide array of foods. Yeah. Can't go wrong with that. No. Oh, that sounds like a wonderful dinner party. So final question, and this is sort of a hallmark question on the show. So in your own words, what does living a creative life mean to you? I think it means being improvisational and living in the moment as best as you can and trying not to always um, angst about the future or, or the past. Try your very best to be in the moment, be mindful, and yet flexible enough to change gears. And uh, I guess pro creative problem solving on your feet is very artistic. I love it. It's always good to be mindful. Yeah, I try. That's another thing the past two years has helped us all with, I think. Yes, yes. I've definitely seen a resurgence in mindfulness. Mm -hmm. can't, can't go wrong with more mindfulness. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for being on the show and the listeners check out the show notes for Tara's bio, as well as links to music therapy organizations. So you can find out more about what we all do. Thanks for stopping by. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Like the show, have a question, stop by the Facebook and Instagram pages. Links are in the show notes or search for creative piecemeal podcast on social media and click follow for all the latest.